Sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand, as long as nobody calls your bluff. I want to distinguish four specific kinds of posturing. The Billy Jack, the Big Fish, the Cool Hand Luke, and the Pusillanimous Posturer. In the natural world, posturing is a threat response in which the individual attempts to make himself appear bigger, stronger, or more dangerous than he really is. Dogs growl and show their teeth. Cats puff out their fur. Horses lay their ears back and paw the ground. Rattlesnakes, well, rattle. The purpose of posturing is to avoid a fight by convincing the adversary to back down, go away. We see this a lot in the animal kingdom between males of the species. It's about who gets to breed. Both parties know that if they actually fight, both of them could be killed or severely injured. And then nobody gets to breed. So they do a little ritual dance instead. They display their attributes so the opponent will say, Okie dokie man, you win. Maybe they may do a little pushing, but no real punching if they can help it. The idea is that the weaker of the two grudgingly concedes and backs off, and the winner lets him go. Of course, sometimes this posturing contest gets out of control, and somebody gets hurt. No system is perfect. It's very likely that every fight you've ever seen was a posturing contest that went south, like the one between Tybalt and Mercutio. In the movie of the same name, Billy Jack, seeing that he is outnumbered and is probably going to get a beating, tells the bad guy he's going to kick him right in the head. And then Billy Jack kicks the bad guy right in the head. Now, this type of posturing isn't really posturing. The Billy Jacker isn't exaggerating, and he's not really trying to avoid escalation. He has both the capacity and the intention to do what he says he's going to do. The Billy Jack is more of a warning shot. You know, if I, if I fire around into the dirt between your feet, I'm letting you know that my gun is loaded and I can hit what I want to hit. What you do with that information is up to you. If I put a shot across your bow, I'm letting you know that I can just as easily put the next one amidships. And you can heave to or not, it's all the same to me. The Billy Jack ain't no act, it's just a fact. The big fish is a narcissist, consumed by his own delusions of grandeur. He's the poster child for the Dunning-Kruger effect. His inflated sense of himself may stem from having grown up someplace where the living was a little bit too easy. The big fish may only be five feet tall, but he thinks he's a giant because he grew up in Munchkinland. He fancies himself a Luciano Pavarotti because he's the very best operatic tenor in Manawi, Nebraska. If the big fish leaves his tiny pond and swims out into the ocean, there's a very good chance he's going to wind up being finger food for somebody with bigger jaws and a two-note cello motif. But he'll splash around a lot until then. The Cool Hand Luke is the cold, calculated bluff artist. A cool hand Luke can make you believe he's got that fourth ace in his hand, or a gun in his pocket, or that the federales are going to be here any second to back him up. Now the cool hand Luke is something good fighters do all the time. Feints, counterattacks, countertimes, all very, well, lucrative. The secret of the cool hand Luke is to be cool. Don't try too hard. Don't oversell it. If you queer the play, the mark is going to call your bluff, and then things could get awkward in a hurry. Now we come to true posturing, aka bluffing, bragging, boasting, 
crowing, puffing, showing off, blowing smoke, blustering, swiring, strutting, shit-talking, and bullshitting. The pusillanimous posturer is all mouth. There's less to him than meets the eye. Uh, all hat, no cattle, as my brother Rick would say. There's no limit to the exaggerations, distortions, misrepresentations, and fabrications he'll puke up. Unlike the Billy Jack, he has neither the capacity nor the intention to follow through. Unlike the big fish, the pusillanimous posturer knows he's lying. Unlike the cool hand Luke, the pusillanimous posturer has no class, no courage, and no cool. For all his puerile bragadaccio, the pusillanimous posturer is a black-souled coward. He's counting on most people being too civilized to call him to account, and he'll be the first one to run to the cops if you look at him cross-eyed, because there are laws protecting him from you, but not you from him. That's the sticks and stones principle on steroids. You know, we used to recognize fighting words. Uh, fighting words are utterances which the speaker knows or should know are so egregiously offensive or threatening that they are reasonably likely to provoke an immediate, forceful physical response. If you insult a man's race or his character, or his wife or his mother, if you threaten to harm his child, his horse, or his dog, you could expect to be bodily chastised and everyone would say, good for him, you had it coming. In the heyday of the duel, you could find your life on the line even for seemingly small transgressions. Duels were fought over a poorly phrased criticism or an indiscreetly raised eyebrow or a slanderous innuendo. But the laws changed on that, for better or worse. Today, with few, if any, social restraints remaining, bullies of all kinds thrive, and bullies of all kinds fall into this fourth category. The common denominator is cowardice. Bullies always select as their targets those whom they believe to be vulnerable, smaller, weaker, powerless, defenseless. Bullies depend on their size and physical strength, or their socioeconomic status, or their backup band of sycophants to prey upon you with impunity. A bully has no respect for others because, despite all his conceits, he has no respect for himself. Deep inside, he knows how weak and fearful he is, and he's terrified that others are going to find out. The social media troll falls into this fourth category, too. The troll is an emotional vampire who derives a sense of power from creating conflict. Disagree with the troll and he doesn't attack your argument because the topic is irrelevant. He does whatever it takes to provoke an emotional response. He thrives on that conflict for the feeling of control it gives him, see? His attack is devoid of reason. It's entirely derision and ridicule, insult, name-calling, all manner of derogatory personal affront, accompanied by implicit or explicit exaggeration of his own knowledge or ability, and quite often topped off with empty threats. He has no need for it to resemble the truth in any way. The dialectical search for truth is irrelevant. It's not an argument with individuals critically examining each other's views. It's just a spewage of whatever he thinks will anger people the most. The distant and anonymous nature of the internet allows the troll to feel safe being so provocative because there's very little chance of any real retribution. It's just a game to him. Similar to the bully, it's a way for the troll to feel powerful without having to be powerful and to attack others without fear of consequences. Unfortunately, this sort of thing has proven contagious and has become ubiquitous online. If you're cool, you know the thing to do is not to engage with these individuals. Ignore them, block them, delete them. Only a fool stops to throw a stone at every dog that barks at him. But when you're attacked, 
When you're attacked emotionally, it's easy to get sucked into a posturing war. And if you do, too often you fire back in the same kind of rude currency that you were dealt. Now, there are two problems with that. First, in combat, verbal as well as physical, your job is to become the locus of control of your opponent's behavior, or at the very least, never let your opponent be in control of yours. Why grant your antagonist the power to make you behave like a jackass? But it isn't just that you lower yourself to their infantile level. The other problem is that if you engage in posturing wars, that rude, insulting, name-calling impulse can become a habit. And habits are hard to break. Habits become part of you. And habits go with you when you're not online, when you're out in the world. What happens then? What if you behave as rudely in the real world as you do online? There are dangerous people in this world. There are people who don't posture. There are people who don't bluff. There are people who don't give a fuck. You can't bullshit them and you won't impress them. And you certainly won't intimidate them, even if you do got a two-piece custom-made pool cue. And you never know who they are either. It's not like they wear a scarlet letter for your convenience. If you should happen to encounter such a person and accidentally, by force of habit, be rude or derisive or insulting, very bad things can happen. And bad things happen fast. Barking dogs don't bite while you're barking. The other dog just bites. So thoughtless, casual rudeness is not a habit I would recommend. Apart from poker, I'm not a big fan of posturing. Two reasons, one tactical, one practical. The tactical reason is simple. Never give up the element of surprise. If you warn someone, you're giving them a chance to take countermeasures. The practical reason is simple too. Some people will call your bluff every time. So if you tell somebody you've got a gun in your pocket and you don't really have one, you're a posturing fool. And if you tell someone you have a gun in your pocket and you do have one, then you're a tactical fool. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. I heard that in a bar in Avon. It's advice you can shake a spear at. Now, if I were more Polonius hunk than Polonius monk, I might tell you this. Be thou neither giver nor taker of shit immoderate and wanton. And this above all, show thine own self-respect, and it must follow as night the day. Thou canst not disrespect any man, for thou knowest not the tincture of his madness, nor the measure of his fuse, or what he might be carrying. <laughs>